Hi, I'm Vanessa Richardson. And I'm Carter Roy. Welcome to Historical Figures, formerly known as Remarkable Lives, Tragic Deaths. Every Wednesday, we discuss a different person's lasting historical impact, unique personality, and impression on the world around them. Our audio biographies cover big lives, but we like to focus on little-known facts. Today, we'll be diving into the life, accomplishments, and ultimate downfall of Roman Emperor and Father of Europe, Charlemagne. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Historical Figures, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast directory. Don't forget to subscribe, because a new episode comes out every Wednesday. I'd like you to imagine, if you will, a state of constant warfare. Military battles spring up on every front of an ever-expanding border, and soon you must learn to work with neighbors who used to be your enemies. Your country is growing more and more culturally diverse with every passing year, but not because of immigrants, rather because of forced assimilation. Lines that once divided us from them shift, and allegiances change constantly. Now imagine that all of this warfare is being done in the name of a religion whose most basic tenet is to love your neighbor as yourself. It seems like a bit of a contradiction, doesn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. But that was what life was like under Charlemagne's rule. When he was crowned King of the Franks in 768, he began an expansionist regime that would prove to be nearly unstoppable during his lifetime. He would be crusading, at least in part, for the chance to spread Christianity across Europe. And spread it he did. At its peak, Charlemagne would control a holy empire that would encompass 429,000 square miles of Western Europe, home to 10 to 20 million people. But before we discuss Charlemagne and his rule, we need to discuss some political background on Europe before he was born. Although by the year 768, Charlemagne would become king of the Franks. An area that would encompass much of Western Europe, including France and Germany today. When he was born, he wasn't even in the line of succession. We don't know the precise place or date of Charlemagne's birth, thanks to the shoddy record-keeping of the time. Depending on the source, Charlemagne could have been born anywhere from 742 to 747. His birthday wasn't recorded because Charlemagne's father, the unimpressively named Pepin the Short, didn't start out as a king either, so his son's birth was more or less considered irrelevant at the time. By the 740s, Pepin was actually what was called the mayor of the palace, a political position that was the real power behind the throne of a figurehead king. Think of him as something like a prime minister. Pepin was the second in command to Childeric III, the latest in a long line of Merovingian rulers stretching back to the middle of the 5th century. Childeric himself had only been king for a short time, his reign beginning in 743. He wouldn't be in power for long. By the end of their 300-year reign over the Franks, the Merovingian kings were seen by most as ineffectual and weak, dubbed the Rouen Fagnon, or do-nothing kings, Einhard, a scholar mostly known for the biography of Charlemagne he wrote in 836, had this to say about Childeric III. There was nothing left for the king to do but to be content with his name of king, his flowing hair and long beard, to sit on his throne and play the ruler, to give ear to the ambassadors that came from all quarters, and to dismiss them, as if on his own responsibility in words that were in fact suggested to him or even imposed upon him. He had nothing that he could call his own beyond this vain title of king and the precarious support allowed by the mayor of the palace in his discretion, except a single country seat that brought him a very small income. That wasn't all Childeric's fault. He had a lot on his plate. Earlier Merovingian kings had conquered so far across Europe at the time that the Frankish people were such a mishmash of cultures and factions that it was hard to keep them all in line. The Frankish kingdom in the 740s mostly encompassed what is known as France and Germany today. But at the time, they were less of a homogenized group of people and more of a loose collection of different tribes, kingdoms, and cultures that all came together under Frankish rule. Pepin was sure he could do a better job of ruling the Franks than Childeric. In 751, with the help of his younger brother Carloman and approval from the Pope, 
Pepin forced Childeric off the throne and into a monastery. Well, sending someone to a monastery was the preferred way to get rid of someone without killing them during the 8th century, by the way. We'll see it come up more than once before the end of this story. Usually this treatment was reserved for royalty and the kinds of people you couldn't easily kill without having a peasant uprising on your hands. Not that there weren't people who opposed Childeric's ousting, but any revolt was easily crushed by Pepin and Carloman. It also helped that their cause was legitimized by the Pope, who fully supported Pepin once he promised to protect Rome from foreign, non-Christian invaders. Oh, and the land and money donations from the Franks to Rome were a big incentive for the church as well. And with that, the Merovingian dynasty ended, and the Carolingian dynasty was born. Pope Zachary declared that Pepin was the new, true king of the Franks, and his sons were the heirs to the throne. One of those sons, of course, was Carlos, soon to be known as Charlemagne. The other, younger son, was named Carloman, after his uncle. Frankish royals liked to name their children after successful family members, as a good omen and a name to live up to. Unfortunately for the modern audience, this just makes things very confusing. Suffice it to say that Carloman the Elder, Pepin's brother, would soon join a monastery himself and be out of the picture. Whether it was actually a higher calling or his older brother's maneuvering that led Carloman to monkhood is up for debate, but neither would be very surprising. Religion and politics were two sides of the same coin in that time. The influence that the royal family carried with the church was crucial to the Carolingian dynasty's power. Having nobles and people with money on your side was one thing, but it was even better to have someone with the power to reinforce the idea of your divine right to power in your back pocket. This tradition started when Pepin the Short convinced Pope Zachary to crown him the true king of the Franks, and continued well into Charlemagne's day. Pepin's example taught his son well about the importance of sending money and political favors to the Pope on a regular basis. That was just the kind of atmosphere that Charlemagne grew up in. Although we don't know much about his early life, again, we aren't even sure exactly where he was born or what year he was born in, we do know about what kind of things would have influenced him. A Christian upbringing was paramount. Germanic tribes like the Franks had been Christianized for much of the last century by the time Charlemagne was born, and it had taken deep root in the culture since the early 600s. But Christianity had a political side to it as well. Being able to claim divine right as a ruler could mean the difference between a long reign and a coup. Pepin's rise to royalty would have taught Charlemagne the importance of having the Pope on your side. Charlemagne understood the power of political connections, but he also understood the power of fighting and conquering. As he grew up, he would have ridden alongside his father in his military interventions in northern Italy and learned firsthand how to wage war against the people threatening the ever-expanding Frankish border. As Charlemagne grew, he began to look the part of the warrior king. Einhardt, his biographer, described him as being broad, strong, and exceptionally tall. He cut an impressive figure leading his troops. But he also had a keen political mind. From a young age, he understood that it took political savvy as well as military prowess to get what he wanted. And what he wanted was the continent of Europe under his thumb. Here's something we think you'll find interesting. Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr working for the defendant in one of America's first murder trials. Silent film star Texas Guinan, who became the queen of the nightclubs during Prohibition. Captain William Kidd, the notorious bloodthirsty pirate, and a respectable gentleman who helped to build New York's greatest church. If these stories spark your interest, check out the podcast Bowery Boys, New York City History. It's not a podcast podcast, but their focus on unique stories from history makes it a no-brainer for our fans. And they have covered so much history. Hosts Tom Myers and Greg Young have 10 years worth of episodes with 241 shows covering over 400 years of American history, from Native American tribes to the Stonewall Riots. And we really think you'll enjoy their latest episode on the life of Edgar Allan Poe. Right. 
They spotlight how Poe wrote his famous poem, The Raven, and the dark details of his most devastating heartbreak, an event tragically played out in the Bronx. Listen to the Bowery Boys podcast now. You can find them wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in today for the stories of Nikola Tesla, Truman Capote, Typhoid Mary, Nellie Bly, and many, many others. Now, let's get back to the story. In September of 768, when Charlemagne was in his early 20s and his brother Carloman in his teens, their father died and passed down the kingship that he had fought and backstabbed his way into attaining. Just like Pepin and the elder Carloman, Charlemagne and his brother would be ruling the Frankish kingdom jointly. Charlemagne inherited the land that his father used to rule, and his brother got the land that his namesake, Uncle Carloman, had previously ruled over. And just like his father before him, Charlemagne wasn't happy with the arrangement. Although he oversaw the profitable outer lands bordering the sea to the northwest, Carloman got the land facing foreign kingdoms to the east. If Carloman wasn't willing to expand the kingdom for them, Charlemagne would take matters into his own hands. Charlemagne struck a deal with the king of Lombardy to the south, now modern-day Italy, to secure a Lombard alliance by marrying the king's daughter. Now, Charlemagne would have political power on his brother's side of the map. But less than a year later, Charlemagne changed his mind. Right. He decided that the Saxons to the north were a bigger problem than annoying his brother and sought a wife from the northern Swabia, modern-day Germany, instead. Understandably, this enraged the Lombard king. He wanted to team up with Carloman to get back at Charlemagne for his political slight. But there was another hitch in the plan. Carloman died. Although allegedly his death was of natural causes, Carloman's death came at an eerily perfect time for his brother. We have no evidence today whether or not Charlemagne had a hand in his brother's death, but it was a lot easier to get away with murder in the 700s. Especially when you were the king. Just saying. Natural causes or not, Carloman's wife was terrified of the power her brother-in-law was wielding single-handedly after her husband's death. She fled with her children to Lombardy, hoping that its king's opposition to Charlemagne could protect her. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, she was right to be afraid. With Carloman gone, there was little stopping his brother from killing her and her children to ensure their branch of the family tree could never encroach on his throne. But running away turned out to be the wrong move. Charlemagne wasn't done with Lombardy, not by a long shot. After his brother's death, he renewed efforts to take Lombardy, this time by force. And in one of his first solo military campaigns, he won. The king surrendered in the summer of 774, and Lombardy was now part of the Frankish kingdom. We don't know for sure what happened to Carloman's wife after the surrender, but it couldn't have been good. At the very least, she would have been shut away in a nunnery for the rest of her life. Around this time was when Charlemagne's military campaign against Saxony truly began. Bordering his kingdom to the north, the Saxons were Charlemagne's most hard-fought enemies. His campaign against them lasted more than 30 years and would be a constant headache for a king who was fighting wars on all fronts of his kingdom. Perhaps the war against the Saxons could be best described by someone who grew up during its peak. Charlemagne's biographer, Einhardt. Here's what he had to say about why the fighting began in Saxony. No war ever undertaken by the Frankish people was more prolonged, more full of atrocities, or more demanding of effort. The Saxons, like almost all the peoples living in Germany, are ferocious by nature. They are much given to devil worship and they are hostile to our religion. They think it no dishonor to violate and transgress the laws of God and man. Hardly a day passed without some incident or other which was well calculated to break the peace. Our borders and theirs were contiguous and nearly everywhere in flat, open country, except indeed for a few places where great forests or mountain ranges interposed to separate the territories of the two people by a clear demarcation line. Murder, robbery, and arson were of constant occurrence on both sides. In the end, the Franks were so irritated by these incidents that they decided that the time had come to abandon retaliatory measures and to undertake a full-scale war against these Saxons. Einhardt, as a deeply religious man and member of Charlemagne's court, is of course very biased in favor of the emperor. 
But as our main primary source of information, he certainly captured the feelings of the Franks toward the Saxons at the time. The rivalry of neighboring kingdoms soon turned into bitter enmity under Charlemagne's reign. What started as an opportunistic attack by the Franks in 772 against one of the Saxons' great pagan sanctuaries became a constant war of attacks and counterattacks. From Charlemagne's perspective, he was trying to convert a barbaric culture to Christianity by any means necessary. From the Saxons' perspective, Charlemagne was trying to destroy their religion, their culture, and their way of life by force. In trying to convert the Saxons, Charlemagne had a long road ahead of him. Far from just following one central religion, Saxon religious beliefs in the 770s could vary greatly from region to region, and many of the Saxon gods would merge into the Norse pantheon of gods like Thor and Odin we know today. Charlemagne's attack in 772 was against a large Saxon religious monument located in modern-day central Germany called the Ermensul, a gigantic pillar that the Saxons believed helped to hold up the universe. As if destroying the Ermensul wasn't enough, Charlemagne also plundered all the gold and monetary offerings the Saxons had left in the sanctuary. He made it clear that this wasn't just looting and plunder, he intended to start a holy war. Well, the Saxons certainly fought back hard against Charlemagne's attempted destruction of their way of life. One of the most significant counterattacks came ten years after the war had begun, in 782. A group of Saxons who had previously surrendered to Charlemagne's forces decided to rebel, killing two of the king's chief lieutenants. Charlemagne responded with disproportionate retribution. He ordered the beheading of the 4,500 Saxons at Verdun he had previously secured as prisoners as punishment for the small group of rebels in their midst. This came to be known as the Massacre of Verdun. The fact that the massacre of 4,500 people in one day seems to be of biblical proportions is no coincidence. Charlemagne likely took inspiration for the attack from the Old Testament. He saw the Saxons' worship of pagan gods and took their rebellion as heresy and a betrayal against the people of God. He saw himself in biblical terms punishing heresy with divine retribution. Although it didn't end the war, the attack was devastatingly effective in both demoralizing the surviving Saxon army and killing off a significant portion of their fighting aged men. Even for supporters of Charlemagne, the Verdun massacre has always been the biggest black mark on his record. Not only did he kill 4,500 people in one day in the name of religion, he killed people who couldn't fight back. But as terrible as this attack was, it wasn't altogether unsurprising. Charlemagne's kingdom was one that was at constant war with its neighbors, and occasionally with itself. Rebellions and uprisings were fairly common, as the many disparate cultures Charlemagne brought together through conquest chafed under their new leadership. But each of these rebellions were quickly crushed under Charlemagne's military might. What's very impressive about Charlemagne as a military leader was his ability to fight wars on multiple fronts, since at any given time he had to divert some of his troops to Saxony rather than focus everything he had on one area of his border. Sometimes this tactic went poorly for him, like his disastrously failed takeover of northern Spain in 778. But most of the time, splitting the focus of his armies actually worked. From the time of his coronation in 768 to his death in 814, Charlemagne's kingdom expanded into Italy, Bavaria, Hungary, and south toward Spain. If Charlemagne's kingdom persisted until today, it would be considered the 16th largest country in the world, far outstripping the size of any modern-day European country. Over the 46 years of his reign, he doubled the size of the Frankish kingdom as he cut a swath through Europe, and his neighbors took notice. Some of these neighbors were the Papal States in Italy, the heart of Roman Catholicism. Charlemagne and his family had always been very close to the Pope's favor, in fact, owing their status as kings to his influence. But now it was time for Charlemagne to hold up his end of the friendship. In 795, Pope Leo III succeeded Adrian I after his death, and was in a bit of a rocky situation. 
He had been elected very quickly, on the same day as Adrian's death, and that made many of Adrian's friends and supporters very angry. They accused Leo of adultery and perjury, claiming he was unfit to be pope. It's unclear as to whether the charges had any merit or were simply an excuse for Adrian's nephew to usurp the new pope's power. These Adrian supporters went even further in their rejection of Leo by attacking him with a group of armed men who tried to cut out his eyes and tongue. The attack left Leo unconscious and badly injured, and he was afraid to turn to his own people for help in fear they might side with his attackers. So he looked elsewhere to the ruler of the Frankish kingdom. Charlemagne, in his self-imposed role as the protector of Christianity in the West, was appalled by the attack. He quickly sent an army to rescue the Pope and transport him safely to Rome, where he could rest and recover. There, Charlemagne vowed to bring Leo's attackers to justice. He was true to his word. Charlemagne traveled to Rome in late 800 to put the full weight of his kingdom against the dissidents. With Charlemagne's help, Leo was able to clear his name of all of the charges brought against him and exile the Adrian supporters who had attacked him. From then on, the Pope owed Charlemagne his life. As much as he had protected the Pope out of a sense of duty to his religion, it was also clear that this was a very advantageous position for Charlemagne to be in. And Pope Leo quickly returned the favor. In the year 800, on Christmas Day, Charlemagne attended Mass led by the Pope in St. Peter's Basilica. As Charlemagne knelt at the altar to pray, Leo placed a crown on his head and declared him Emperor of the Romans. This was a big deal, not only because, by all accounts, the Pope hadn't discussed the move with Charlemagne beforehand. Well, the real problem was that there was already a Holy Roman Emperor, and she wasn't going to give up her title so easily. That's right. Empress Irene of Constantinople ruled over the Eastern Byzantine Empire, and her line of royalty had essentially been nullified by Pope Leo. What Leo had done by crowning Charlemagne as Emperor of the Romans was split the title of Emperor into two warring factions who would fight against each other for legitimacy for several years. Whether he was aware of the strife his coronation would cause or not, Charlemagne apparently didn't want the title of Emperor and would have rejected it if he had known what was going to happen beforehand. His biographer, Einhardt, had this to say about Charlemagne's reaction. He at first had such an aversion that he declared that he would not have set foot in the church the day that the imperial titles were conferred, if he could have foreseen the design of the Pope. Still, you have to take Einhardt with a grain of salt. It's possible he just wanted Charlemagne to seem humble in the face of such unimaginable power. Historians debate to this day whether or not Charlemagne really knew what he was doing when he approached the altar on Christmas Day. The giant jeweled crown sitting next to the Pope would have been a dead giveaway, right? No, well, it probably would have been. But who was Charlemagne to resist the Pope? Above all else, he saw himself as a servant of and protector of God's will. And it isn't like he didn't roll with a title when it was given to him. Apparently, Charlemagne preferred to be called something that translated to Charles, most serene Augustus crowned by God, the great peaceful emperor ruling the Roman Empire, instead of just Imperator Romanorum, or Emperor of the Romans. It's certainly more of a mouthful that way. But now that Charlemagne had fully settled into his role as emperor, conqueror, and bastion of Christianity, there was the matter of who would take up his mantle after he died. As Emperor Charlemagne entered his 60s, he thought more and more about his own mortality and the legacy he would leave behind. We'll discuss his legacy, as well as the question of who would be heir to his throne, when we return. If you were a theater kid in high school, there's a good chance that you either performed or knew someone who performed the musical Pippin. Ever since its debut on Broadway in 1972, the Stephen Schwartz written musical has been a favorite show at high schools and community theaters around the world. Its popularity even garnered it a Tony-winning Broadway revival in 2013. 
But if you've never heard of Pippin, you might be wondering why we're talking about it in a show about Charlemagne. After all, a religious crusader from the 8th century doesn't sound like fodder for a light-hearted musical, right? In the strange and wonderful world of Broadway, weirder things have happened. In the simplest of terms, the musical is about Pippin, the son of Charlemagne, trying to find his place in the world. But if you've seen the show, you know the story is a bit more complicated than that. That's right. Far from being an historically accurate work of fiction, Pippin is an anachronistic, fourth-wall-breaking meta-narrative that only the 70s could have dreamed up. Even Charlemagne only exists in the story as a kind of symbol of war, violence, and the struggle between father and son. The army of the enemy is stationed on the hill, so we've got to draw them down here where they're easy up to kill. It's a very strange story, but you've got to admit, even 40 years on, the songs are still great. Praise be to Charles, our Lord. Triumphant is his sword. But even fans of the musical might not know that, despite all its historical inaccuracies, the character of Pippin was indeed based on a real person. It's true. It is a matter of historical record that Charlemagne's first son was named Pepin, sometimes referred to as Pippin. What is less clear is the circumstances of Pepin's birth, or whether or not he was ever a legitimate heir to the throne. Pepin was the son of Charlemagne and Himmeltrude, who some scholars believe was a noblewoman from Germany, and others believe was just one of Charlemagne's concubines. Whoever she was, she was never officially married to Charlemagne, as their marriage would have had no political benefit. However, they may have been married in the Germanic tradition, a legal but not binding form of marriage that was not recognized by the church. Honestly, we know next to nothing about Himmeltrude, except that she was the mother of Charlemagne's first son. But legitimate or not, this was not the son Charlemagne wanted. Shortly after birth, it was discovered that Pepin, who was named after Charlemagne's father, had a spinal deformity commonly known as a hunchback. Rather than celebrate that his son was otherwise healthy, Charlemagne despised the fact that he had passed on his family name to a disabled child. He even went on to change the name of one of his younger sons from Carloman to Pepin, just to ensure that there was a Pepin in the family tree that better fit his idea of what royalty should look like. It was a hard life for Charlemagne's eldest son. Although he did grow up at his father's side, he never fit in, and could never live up to his father's expectations of an heir to the throne. Eventually, as Charlemagne's kingdom grew and he groomed his other sons to take the throne, he disinherited Pepin entirely, allowing him to live in his palace but taking away any claim he had to the throne. Of course, this enraged Pepin, who had been trying his whole life to gain his father's trust and affection. In 792, when Pepin was 23 years old, he hatched a plot with some Frankish nobles to try and kill his father and take the throne. The kingdom was in the midst of a famine, and Charlemagne's divine right was looking shakier and shakier as more people died under his rule. Pepin saw this as a sign that God did not approve of his father's actions, and that he should take over to make things right. The nobles he was colluding with agreed. However, the plan to kill Charlemagne was discovered before it could be put into action. Many of the nobles involved were put to death for their scheming. In what was seemingly his first act of paternal affection, Charlemagne spared Pepin's life, sending him instead to live the rest of his days in a monastery. It seems that even though Charlemagne treated Pepin terribly because of his disability and or his illegitimacy, he still couldn't bring himself to sentence his firstborn son to death. Despite his problems with his first son, Charlemagne had many more children after him. Mm, At least 18 of them in all. His three oldest male heirs were produced by his second wife, Hildegard, whom he married around 771 after repudiating his first Lombard wife for a more politically advantageous marriage. Hildegard's three oldest sons were Charles, Pepin, and Louis. 
Remember that this Pepin was the one originally named Carloman, like his uncle and great-uncle, but was renamed when Charlemagne disinherited his hunchbacked eldest son. And this is why it's important to be more creative with your names, folks. History enthusiasts like us can get confused. Fast. If you're keeping count, that's the fourth Pepin we've met so far. The children that did manage to stay in their father's good graces were treated fairly well. They were all educated, even the daughters, which was significant for the time, even if it was in more, quote, womanly pursuits like needlepoint and cooking. Right, because girls can't learn horseback and the art of war. Well, Charlemagne was nothing if not a man of his time. That was also probably the reason why he forbade his daughters from marrying. He didn't want any challenges to his power from any branches of the family tree they produced. That doesn't sound like very good parenting at all. Mm. Yeah, more like a warrior king's pragmatism. Although he seemed to care for his children in his own way, he cared for his power as a ruler first and foremost. That's why he appointed kingships to three of his sons while they were still children. That's right. His second oldest son, Charles, was appointed king of the Franks like his father before him. Next oldest, Pepin, was given the sub-kingdom of Italy, and youngest, Louis, was only three years old when he was crowned King of Aquitaine, modern-day France. Whoa, that's a lot of responsibility to give to a kid. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently they took it in stride. As the boys grew up, they followed in their father's footsteps, eventually fighting border skirmishes for him with their own armies. However, the only one of the three to outlive his father was Louis, the youngest son of Charlemagne and Hildegard. The middle brother, Pepin, died of disease contracted during a siege of Venice in 810. The oldest, Charles, died less than a year after of a stroke. Both men were in their early 40s at the time of their death. By 813, Charlemagne knew he was dying too. He suffered from fevers, shortness of breath, and chest pains, and he refused to take the advice of any of his doctors. <laughs> In fairness, they were asking him to switch from a diet of roasted meat to boiled meat, which to an appetite like Charlemagne's was apparently a fate worse than death. Ooh, I think most people would agree with him. Mm. Charlemagne crowned his son, Louis, co-emperor, and died in his sleep less than a year later on January 28, 814. According to his biographer, Charlemagne died at age 72. Louis was then tasked with ruling the empire his father built. But by most accounts, he wasn't up to the task. Although he was known as Louis the Pious, that didn't mean he was a nice guy. One of his first acts as emperor was to banish all of his sisters to nunneries. If you'll recall, that was the favored way of getting rid of people you didn't like in the Christian Middle Ages. He also exiled many of his father's advisors and members of the court he found to be morally distasteful. Despite his supposed moral purity, Louis found it hard to keep together the disparate people his father united through war and diplomacy. He would weather three civil wars throughout his reign and never fully quelled the unrest in his lifetime. All in all, the Carolingian Empire founded by Charlemagne would last for 88 years, Although for much of that time following Louis's death, it would be ruled by autonomous kingdoms rather than a central ruler. Charlemagne's influence over the territory he ruled and conquered would be felt for decades, even centuries to come. Today, he is mostly remembered for spreading the idea of Christianity to the kingdom he conquered. For better or worse, the religion found its foothold in Europe largely through Charlemagne's crusade to spread his empire. It wasn't only war and religion that Charlemagne brought with him, though. The social component of Christianity at the time brought renewed interest in artistic and intellectual pursuits. Instead of only forming social bonds with one's family, Christianity connected people to a larger community that encouraged religious art and writing. One of the most interesting and influential intellectual advancements during Charlemagne's reign was the introduction of Carolingian minuscule in around 780, a type of handwritten script. This script was much easier to read than the cramped handwriting of before, largely due to the introduction of distinct uppercase and lowercase letters and spaces between words. What we take for granted in our writing nowadays was created by Charlemagne's wish to have a uniform and legible system of writing. Although he was dubiously literate himself, he knew the value of recording and preserving important texts. 
This isn't to say that this renewed interest in the scholarly pursuits and reestablishment of Western Europe was worth the deaths of thousands of people and the subjugation of thousands more. But no matter what your opinion on whether Charlemagne was a good or bad influence on history, it's clear that his influence irrevocably changed the face of Europe and of Christianity forever. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Historical Figures. A new episode comes out every Wednesday, so don't forget to subscribe to Historical Figures on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, or your favorite podcast directory. And while you're there, leave us a five-star review. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and on Twitter at Parcast Network or through our website, Parcast.com. That's P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. As always, we thank you for listening. Historical Figures was created by Max Cutler. It is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, with production assistance by Carrie Murphy and Joel Stein. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Historical Figures is written by Jordan Lyric and stars Vanessa Richardson and Carter Roy. Our amazing voice actor is Mike Capozzi. 